Burl messed her up this morning talking about her and Bethany hasn't been singing very long and the Lord's just really using her in a mighty way and I'm proud of her because it took a lot of courage to get up here. <laughs> a whole lot of courage. The greatest sin in all of the world, if I was to ask you that question, what do you believe is the greatest sin in all of the world? I would get a numerous, uh, uh, various type of answers that would come forth. What is the greatest sin in all the world? Some of you would probably answer out of maybe sins that people have committed which have violated you personally. Possibly you would speak of the greatest sin in all the world of being someone who would have violated you in a sexual manner. Some of you might say that, it, that, that you feel that the uh, verbal harassment that, put, that people come under bondage with many times with the verbal harassment and abuse, that that is just as bad as physical abuse because all of us see our levels of pain in different areas. You know what I mean? We, we don't know how to compare the pain that we've gone through necessarily with someone else's pain and someone else's violation. And so some of you would have different types of answers to that question. Some of you would say that maybe rape was the greatest sin in all the world. Some of you would say adultery. Some of you would say murder. But I was reading a book by John Maxwell and a statement just leaped off of the pages at me. And I totally agree with what he's saying. He said the greatest sin in all the world was committed by Adam because he failed to be all that his creator intended him to be. He failed to be all that his creator intended him to be. And ladies, you were created for a purpose. The creator allowed you to be born. He allowed you to exist and he allowed you to be here at this very time because he has a purpose for your life. There was a destiny for you to accomplish for his kingdom's sake. We're not all necessarily called to full-time ministry and to stand on a platform or hold a, a microphone, but we are all called to do the work of the ministry. And I wanna challenge you from the very onset of this message. Don't make the same mistake that Adam made. Determine that you're going to accomplish what the Creator intended for you to accomplish. Now for a lot of us, in order for us to walk in God's purposes for our life, in order us for, uh, for us to walk in, in such a path that He had intended for us to walk in, we will have to make some major changes in our own life. I'm going to deal with some of that today. Because you see, I just shared with you the greatest sin in all of the world. But I'm gonna share with you now what I think is one of the saddest verses in the book of, uh, 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 in God's word, in the Bible. And it is found in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30. And God says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. I found none. How tragic. We're talking about the creator of all times. From, from the very uh, beginning of time, from creation. He's creating people because he desires them to walk in obedience to him. He wants mankind to have communion with him. So he creates Adam and Eve and, and then they fail. And, and, and now he no longer has that intimacy with him that, that he once had. Years later, as, as the prophet Ezekiel is looking for somebody, you know, to stand with him and help, you know, as an intercessor, it says that God, it wasn't just Ezekiel, not just a man who was looking around, you know, as a pastor, some of you may be in pastoral positions or maybe you're women ministry leaders and you might look out through your group of people that you're working with and think, now, who could I find to handle this job? But God himself sought he looked to and fro, trying to find someone who would stand in the gap. And he found none. 
And today, September the 18th, 2000, God is still searching for someone who will say, I will be committed. I will be what you intended for me to be. I understand that you're my creator. I understand that you're looking for someone that you can use. Someone who you can not only pour your power into, but someone that your power can be released through to touch the lives of other people. He is still looking, and I have to ask you, what will your answer be? I think it was January of uh, 99 when I was speaking here at the conference, and the message the Lord gave me was, it's time to grow up. And I asked the ladies, why did you come to this conference? Did you come just to get blessed? Oh, it's okay to come and get a blessing, but the church has been selfish and self-centered for far too long. We should come to get a blessing that we can take it back to where we came from and we can release that power through those people that we come in contact with. That's what it's all about. That's the purpose of it. And God's looking for people who will release his power. And I believe there's a whole lot of you in this room today that you're at that place. But the message the Lord's given me to share, we're going to go to in just a moment. And I just want to say as I get actually started on my sermon now, that was just the introduction, was that, uh, that I believe that, as I shared a while ago, it's time for character to be developed in the body of Christ. I told the ladies in our church, I said, you know, I said, when they told me they wanted to have this mentoring class, I believe there were 25 ladies that initially signed to be a, a part of this mentoring for women who felt called to ministry. And I was like, wow, I can't get over this. And so I started working with them, and we only meet once a month because I don't have a lot of time to spend with them. You know, I thought, oh, I always thought of a mentoring relationship meant you were together all the time like Elijah, Elijah, and that's not reality. I can't do that. I'm a wife and a mother, let me, just clear, let me just say this, I'm a wife and a mother first and foremost, and that's my highest calling. And I will never get that out of alignment. I'm married to a, a powerful man of God whom I adore, and who, as uh, Burrow was saying this morning, in fact, she says, our husbands, our churches, our everything, so much alike, our churches, uh, when you go to her church, it looks just like you're at our church because there's every kind of culture represented and everything. And her, uh, but my husband has encouraged me in ministry and he pushes me out there. But, you know, I don't know who all's in here and I don't know what levels of ministry or whatever you might be involved in, but your ministry it, it, out to other people is never to come before your ministry to your family. So please keep that in a proper perspective. God's given me the privilege to, to raise two wonderful children. Both of them are called to the ministry. Both of them have the anointing of God upon their life. They're used. My son preaches. My daughter shared her first message in youth about three weeks ago. And she had five pages of notes. It took her five minutes, and I had to stand right beside her till she got through it. But, hey, I'm raising up preachers. I believe that when the word of God said we're supposed to go forth and multiply and everything, it wasn't just so we could have, you know, a bunch of kids and so that they could be effective in the kingdom of God. That's the purpose. So anyway, I want to talk to you today about Mary. Because I feel like this is what God's sharing me to, you know, having me to deliver with you to you today. Anybody in here, you've come from a Catholic background. A lot of you. New Orleans is a city that's predominantly Catholic, and I don't know if that's the reason that I personally have not grown up hearing a lot of messages about Mary. I, I, I don't know if, if maybe that's everywhere or if it was just in New Orleans. We had to kind of push away from that because, you know, that people deified her. And so I want to state from the beginning of this message that I am in no way deifying Mary, but she is a character in the Bible that we can learn from, just as we preach messages about the life of Moses and Joseph and everybody else, you know, and Esther and Deborah, Mary was mightily used of God. So if, you, if we have some uh, people in here that maybe are anti-Catholicism, just get over that for a little bit, put it on a shelf, because I, I know that some of the people in our church who come out of Catholicism, they don't want anything to do with it, okay? <laughs> but, you know, I, with, 
they've got some powerful truths that we can learn from. So I am not up here to come against uh, a denomination or anything of that nature. And, and I'm glad that each one of you are here, but I want to state that I do not deify Mary, I do not worship her, and we do not pray to her. That is not what this is about. But she is a woman of God, and we're going to study about her life today. You know, when a man looks for a woman, and I don't know why from the onset last night, everything has tended to fall right in line about relationships and marriages, but I, I'm going to talk to the singles for a little while because I'm talking about a man who's looking, okay? So when you've got a man that's looking for a woman, of course he looks from the outward, outward you know, exterior first. He's looking for something that's fine, you know, that kind of takes care of herself. But I believe he's looking for someone he can trust. Trust. It's a difficult word today because we've been hurt in relationships and we, we tend not to allow trust to be operative within our lives. We even push God aside at times because we don't have the trust that we should have for people. And we, we sometimes allow that to affect us in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. But God is looking for someone that He can trust. He's searching to and fro. There was a meeting that took place in heaven. And the three members of the Godhead, they had this meeting. And they said, we recognize that the way we've been doing things just isn't working anymore. And we need a sacrifice lamb. We've got to make a change. The old is not working. We've got to have a new thing. So Jesus said, I will go. And I will be that sacrifice lamb. He volunteered. He made the choice to go and to take that place. But you see, when he came to this decision, then they had to figure out a strategy. Okay, now how are we going to make this happen? Well, let's just have him be born as, as a normal man would be born. Let's just, let's just have it take place, you know, the natural procedures and let it follow the natural course. Now, how can we go about this? And God began to look for a lady that he could use, who he could trust that would stand true to him in both the good and the bad times. And the Word of God says in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 28, that where they had found this young lady by the name of Mary, who was... She was already espoused to be Joseph's wife. They were not married yet. They were in like a legal contract already until time for the wedding. And she was espoused to him. And she was to, you know, be married to him, but she was a virgin. And Luke chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when I was reading this, I, I, though I've heard this my whole life, I thought, God, when you look at me, can you say that about me? You know, I love to read where God, it says that he looked on Abraham as his friend. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. I want to be a woman that God knows he can trust me with whatever he needs to trust me with. And if he has to birth something in me, maybe that I wasn't even expecting, or, or maybe to take me and change the whole course of my life where I wasn't even expecting it, I want to be a woman of God that will say, here am I. You can use me. Oh, I pray that when he looks at us, he says, thou art highly favored. Thou art highly favored. Blessed art thou among women. Because once again, God was searching for someone and he found Mary and verse 29 says and when she saw him she was troubled at his saying and she cast in her mind what what manner of salutation this should be you know what kind of greeting is this an angel's gonna come tell me this kind of stuff what is going on and verse 30 it says and the angel said unto her, fear not Mary for thou hast found favor 
with God. She was highly favored. Now, why, why was she chosen? That's what we're talking about today, because she was a woman that God could trust. And I'd like for you, if you have your Bibles, if you're taking notes, I see a lot of you are, then just write this down. Luke 2, 34 and 35. And before I read it, let me ask you, how many of you have ever gotten a prophetic word that you didn't like? You didn't want, you were sure it was a false prophet, and you said, get thee behind me, Satan, I rebuke you. I will not, ex I will not accept that word. <laughs> I think I would have had to do this, okay? First of all, here's this young lady in love with a man, you know, getting ready to be married to this man. And an angel has the audacity to show up and tell her now she's going to have a baby. Uh, oh, and I'm going to have it of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right. Okay. This has never happened before. Yeah. I, I don't know about this. Then she gets this word from Simeon. Let's read this. And Simeon, verse Luke 2, 34, 35. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother. This is while she was holding the baby. The baby was born at this point. And he says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. For a sign which shall be spoken against. Now how many of you, you will stand before the prophet, before the man of God with your baby. And you want him to tell you that your baby is a, a sign that's going to be spoken against? It gets better. Yay. A sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Well, glory to God. That's what I came here to hear from you, old prophet man of God. A soul's going to pierce through my soul. But he didn't stop there. He said that the hearts of many may be revealed. Now, let me talk to you. Throughout God's word, we see where people have no spiritual discernment. God tries to manifest his power to them. He'll tell them things that are going to happen. Even throughout Christ's life, he's telling them about how he's going to die and be raised again. He keeps trying to tell them. And they have no spiritual discernment. They don't understand what he's talking about. And, and, and I'm telling you that because we're that way. God tells us things. We have no spiritual discernment. We have no clue of what he's talking about. And here's this poor young lady who has received all of these words at this time. And none of them make sense to her. Yet she still had a heart that was one that trusted and she was still committed and she was faithful and you know there's times ladies that we give up over the most foolish thing and you're here today so you haven't given up but you know sisters in Christ that things have been said to them and things have happened to them and they maybe they felt like their very soul had been pierced through but they gave up they didn't persevere they really couldn't be trusted to carry the call. We're going to talk about the piercings of Mary's soul. She went through seven different piercings. You see, God chose Mary because he knew he could trust her. He did not need somebody he could trust just in the good times because we all know there was a lot of bad times coming for Christ. He had to have a woman he could trust through the bad times. Her heart was to be pierced time and again. God doesn't ask, can I trust this person to make it through just one storm, just for one event? No, it's can I trust you to go through all of these issues? He wants to know, can I trust you through the ages and the stages, through the eras and through the eons, and to be as faithful at the end as you were at the beginning? Can he trust you to do that? Ask yourself that question. Can I go, trust you to go through changes yet still never change except to walk in a deeper relationship? Can he trust you to maybe relocate, but yet you never move in your commitment to him? It never wavers. Can he trust you to be altered, but yet never really different because your focus is still upon him. You are committed to him. Mary was about to engage on a journey for the rest of her life, and everything in her life was going to change. Everything she had dreamed about and thought as a young lady, it was all changed because she was willing. She was willing. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit 
of the joints and of the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And you know, uh, I just want you to understand that the sword comes in to sever our soul because our soul houses our emotions. And we as women, though we might not admit it if there was a bunch of men in here, but it's just us so we can talk about it. We tend to be emotional at times. We might need a few swords to come in and, and cut that soul and separate it because the point is, well, I didn't mean to say point, but oh well, it works. But, but the point is that if you are led by your emotions, it hinders your spirit. It will destroy your spirit. Your spirit man is your communicator with God Almighty. And we've got to come to a place where we're not going to be led around by our emotions all the time. We're not going to just go around cast down because everybody's hurt us and they've done things to us or to our family, rejected us and, and pushed us aside because there's somewhere, somewhere there's got to be ladies who are going to stand up and say, I'm committed to you, Lord, and I'm with you for the long haul. Nothing is going to me to turn my back and you can trust me you can trust me Mary endured these seven piercings and we're gonna talk about the first one was misunderstanding Misunderstanding. She was misunderstood by the people who, who were her loved ones, the ones who, whose opinion really matters. You know, there's other people that can disagree with us, and it might bother us a little bit, but our family and the people that we love, we really, you know, I, I, we want them to believe in us. I am 40 years old. My mother and dad, I know I don't look a day over 20. And if you'll tell them that at the table, you can get a discount. No, I'm teasing. But, <laughs> but... My, you know, my mom and dad, I still seek their counsel on decisions that I make. And if I feel they're disappointed in a decision that I'm making, it affects me. And I have to sit down and talk with them. And I have to say, well, am I wrong? We had a situation that arose just a few weeks ago. And I, and I called, my, called my dad. I said, Dad, I said, I really feel like this is what the Lord's telling me. And this is a situation. And I recognize people could be hurt in this situation. And I don't want to handle it wrong. And I just wanted to seek your counsel. It matters to me. I want my loved ones to understand me. And I want to feel their acceptance and their approval of things that I am dealing with and things I'm going through within my life. Mary was misunderstood by her loved ones, first of all, by Joseph. As a matter of fact, when you read about this story in the book of Matthew, it says that he sought to try to get rid of her privately. He was trying to figure out, mm, how can I get rid of this girl? I'm sure he thought she was, well, how do they say, a local uh, cabeza, something like that? <laughs> I'm sure he thought she was nuts. Coming and telling him an angel came to her and is telling her that she's going to have a child. And that's not good enough. It's going to be the Son of God. Oh, and you're conceiving of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Where could we could get her committed? <laughs> How quickly could we take care of this poor girl? Something's gone wrong. You see, don't you know? I mean, really, they were real people. And I'm sure he thought that. So she wasn't understood by him. Then he did have the dream, and the angel had to come and tell him, hey, it's okay, don't worry about it. This is, she's telling you the right thing. But just because they too had these dreams and angelic visitations, nobody else did. Now, if your parents are around somebody that's a little nutso, you take your kids and you pull them away from them. Right? Don't you know she would be in the marketplace trying to, you know, buy groceries and things, and, and people are saying, oh, that's that crazy girl. Be over here. Stay away from her. You don't know what she'll do. She's nuts. She's telling everybody she's going to have God's son. She was misunderstood. Yet she still was willing to pay the price to carry Christ. You've been called to be a carrier of Christ, but are you willing to pay the price? Because you know what? Sometimes we can walk into the bathroom at church and 
hear somebody in the stall next to us make a little comment about us and we're ready to give up. But for nine months, everywhere she went, and probably after then also, oh, she's carrying that little boy. He looks just like Joseph to me, and she said he was the Holy Ghost child. I'm sure they all still misunderstood her, you know. In other words, let me just tell you about me. If I'm going to read the Bible, I have to put myself in there. I have to, like, become part of the story. I have a nephew one time that uh, when he was about three years old, he apparently is just like me in that matter because he said he would tell us the Bible stories. He would say, and when I went out there to kill Goliath, I got me five stones. There were five stones by the brook, and I put them in my slingshot, and man, I, and he would tell the whole story because he did it. Well, I'm kind of like that. I have to put myself in the story, in the situation. And I believe those were things that happened. And I've been through some situations in my life where people have said harsh things about me. And they've said harsh things about my family. And there were times that it literally made me want to turn and run. Because there were times that the pain was so deep, my soul was, be was being pierced. And it was so deep, I didn't think I could endure the pain. Especially if it was my family they were speaking against. I can take it a little better if you want to talk about me, but don't talk about my family. But I felt like my soul was being pierced at times. And I wanted to turn and just run and, you know, go around in life with like a headphones on my ears. Those big giant going where I couldn't hear what anyone was saying. But she was misunderstood. Yet she didn't give up. I'm sure she was laughed at. Do you know that nowhere in the word of God does it say she defended herself? The only person we're told of that she gave an explanation to was Joseph. But we're not told anywhere that she defended herself. And yet that's usually our reaction. We want to, we want to defend ourselves when somebody comes against us. But I think we can learn from that characteristic in her life. She walked through adversity and she delivered in the midst of misunderstanding without fighting for herself because she didn't have to argue to prove that this was a holy thing. And ladies, some of you, there's dreams and visions that are being birthed inside of you of the Holy Ghost. First of all, use wisdom. You don't need to just tell everybody about it. But if they don't understand, they can't understand if they haven't had the same revelation you've had. You don't have to defend it if it's of God. You don't have to stand there and defend it. You know it's of God, so go for it. God never has to be defended. You see, Philippians 1, 6 says to be confident, being confident of this one thing, that he that began a good work in you will complete it. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And I love that. I stand upon that passage and almost everybody I minister to at the altar, I quote that verse to them because I want them to understand it might be hard today, baby, and you might not feel like you can make it, but if you'll just hang on, he began a good work in you. He's not giving up on you. He's going to complete it. He's going to perform it. Are you willing to be controversial to produce the Christ in you? Are you willing to be controversial to produce the Christ in you? Is God doing something important enough in your spirit for you to endure misunderstanding? Because if the promise came from God, he will perform it and he will bring it about. Number two, the second piercing of her soul was keeping secrets. She had to hide a treasure. She had to keep secrets. Here she is. Now, before this child is born, I've already explained to you how bizarre the whole thing was. I mean, just in a little 10-minute discussion here, but I mean, this is what she lived for months and months. She lived this. She, she went through this. But then she's finding out that her baby's life is threatened before it was even born. How many of you in this room, you had a difficult pregnancy and nearly lost a child or maybe your own life? You know how that felt. I, I went through that with my first child. And you feel so hopeless. Because there's an outside force that's working against the life that you're carrying, trying to destroy that life. Well, here's a woman carrying a child that she didn't ask for. 
and she's told that the baby's life is in danger and she understands that it's been birthed of the Holy Ghost because she's still a virgin and and so she it doesn't make sense but I mean she's accepted that fact because she's not been with anyone and so she's having this child and she's hearing that its life is being threatened she had to hide that treasure so here she is now removed from family and friends and people that she knew. She and Joseph are off hiding in another area, you know, having to have the baby born. And in the end, they can't even go anywhere near where Herod and his people are because they're trying to kill. And this isn't really part of my message, but let me just tell you something. The generation of young people that's alive today, Satan's done everything he can to destroy them. And I pray to God that you've got an incredible youth ministry in your church and that you're understanding and recognizing the treasure that is within them, that you're releasing it because there's a reason. There is a reason that Satan has come so strong against this generation. He's afraid of them. He's intimidated of them because he sees the power in them. He sees the destiny that's inside of them. He was scared of Christ and tried to wipe him out and abolish him before he was ever born. He's done it to our, to our kids. It came through abortion. You know, when half of these kids were born, that's when abortion started getting really uh, popular and legalized and everything. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're living in right now. Because Satan recognizes the anointing upon our lives more than we do. So he tries to distract us and divert us so that we'll never accomplish what the creator intended us for so she had to hide this treasure and let me just ask you something can God do something wonderful in your life without you flaunting it can he give you an ability knowing that you're not going to rush up to the stage so that you can display it can he trust you to hide his treasures can he trust you to keep a secret it's a new thing that was happening because the birth of Christ was new to Mary and to others, you know. And you might have to experience a new thing in your life. You may not understand it and others may not. And you may have to hide that new thing. Let God be able to trust you to hide his treasures. The third piercing was separation. When Mary and Joseph were coming from Jerusalem they were uh, for Nazareth after the Passover, they realized that Jesus, who was only 12 years old, had been left behind. And it said that the Bible says that a day's journey had passed before they realized that Christ was not with them. And I cannot imagine the anguish that Mary went through at that moment when she realized he was not in the group. Because it wasn't just like an average person who maybe misplaces their child at the mall or something like that, you know. It wasn't like she could go to the loudspeaker and page him, you know, or have, tell the security what, she, what clothes he was wearing and have them go look for him. It wasn't that type of a setting. This is a woman that knew that Herod still wanted her child dead. And I personally think that one of the first thoughts that probably came to her mind was... Herod and his soldiers have gotten my son. They finally won. He's gone. And she's frantically rushing through the crowd, trying to find him. And that had to seem like an eternity until she located her son. She had to go through the pain of separation. First of all, I told you separation from family and loved ones. You know, when I was having a baby, I wanted my mother there with me. I wanted my whole entire family there, but it was very important for my mother and my husband to be there with me. You know, and, and she had Joseph with her, but she wasn't there with the rest of her family because she'd had to go to Egypt in order to try to protect the child, you know, because she was hiding that treasure. And so now this separation and the second separation went from Christ, it was kind of getting her ready for other pains and other piercings of her soul she was going to go through. But she was a woman who learned not to live by her emotions you see I relate to this a little bit because you know I, my children are totally different I'm sure all of you your children are totally different and uh, Brandon was the type that if I went to the mall with him I always knew where he was because he's a lot like his mother and he never shuts up so I could hear him talking constantly so if he just scooted a little ways away from me it didn't matter because he was talking and he was reading the price tags and everything cost fifty dollars I don't know what that was about but everything was fifty dollars he'd say I'd say how much is that he'd say um it's fifty dollars mama and so I knew then Bethany came along and she was totally different 
I had seen these people whom I interpreted to be child abusers who would put on their children these harnesses. They looked like a dog leash. And I have to admit to you that I had been critical of those people until Bethany came along. Bethany always, from the time she could talk for about two years, wanted to wear pink. And I didn't want her to wear pink. I, I, I'm going to expose to you that I've had some pride in my life. I was afraid people would think that I put the same dress on the child every Sunday. I know you've never thought of things like that about your children. But I did. So I would drive up to church hurrying so I could get in and lead praise and worship at the service. And, and she'd be maybe 18, 19 months old. She wasn't even two yet. She had undone the whole seatbelt harness thingamajiggy that was on her and had only her diaper on. I said, Bethany, what are you doing? I've got to get to the platform. Where were your clothes? I told you pink. She wasn't wearing that yellow dress or yellow socks or whatever it was. Didn't matter how much had been paid for it. Didn't matter how long I'd had it and lay away. She wanted pink. The child even only drank pink milk. We had to get the pink strawberry stuff because she was underweight, nothing like her mother, but she was always underweight. So the only way we could, the doctor said, do whatever you have to do to get her to eat. If she wants pink, give her pink. So we had pink Nestle's quick in the milk. She's always known what she wanted. And Brandon's always been so easy to just persuade. And I know y'all have some Bethany's. Y'all are relating to me. I see those hands. So I talked to my mother one day about that. I said, Mother, I don't know what to do. I said, and I spanked her and I put her clothes back on her. And I said, you know, I get so aggravated at her. I said, because, you know, you raised us where this is what you told us. You said, because I'm the mother and I said it and that's it. And I hated that. And I swore I would never say that. And I hear it coming out of my mouth. You will wear the blue dress because I'm the mother and I said it and that's it. And my mother told me, Bev, honey, I know that it is important. You, you can't let her know that she's winning. Because you can't. Now, you know you can't. That's the problem with half the kids today, all right? Because they haven't had discipline. And if they did have it, it wasn't in love. And so they think they're winning and they're running the whole thing. So I had to find out a way so she didn't know she was winning, okay? So mother said, put like three different pink dresses there and give her her choice of which one she wants to pick or maybe put some other colors out there and let her, let her pick which one she wants. She said, because you have to choose your battles and you may have to tear her rear end up if she's running out to the street. But you know what? You can live with her wearing pink every day. So I swallowed my pride and... I let her win, but I didn't do it where she knew she won. I had to let her know that this is, this is what you can choose from and this is it. So we were shopping. She would get out of the stroller thingy, you know? So I became an abusive parent and bought the harness. And let me tell you, I could have saved my money because she had not had it on for 10 minutes before she figured her way out of all of, there were two or three different little attachment things, you know, that fastened different ways. I bought the best. <laughs> I was like, I gotta keep a rain on this kid, you know? She was out of it. Now you have to understand, my family was going through a terrible period of time that I'm not gonna elaborate on, but I'm just gonna say, there had been death threats upon our family and even upon our children. So in this one capacity, 
I can relate to the horror that Mary must have felt when she couldn't find her son. Because by the time I had turned around to start looking at the clothes on the rack, I began to feel that that leash was loose. And I looked, and she was gone. I said, Bethany, Bethany, where are you? Bethany, nothing, not a sound. Bethany, this is not funny. Where are you? I know you can't be far. Well, she was hidden maybe five minutes in the clothes, didn't make a sound, didn't move, nothing. And it seemed like five hours. And those moments, possibly you've lost your child somewhere makes you want to lose your mind, or actually once you find them, you decide you do want to become an abusive parent. <laughs> Let me see, maybe this does work. I'll teach them to stay with me. But Mary went through the pain of separation, and I'm being comical about it, but I hope that you're getting the point that it had to be a frightening experience. She was a woman that regardless of how badly her emotions, her soul was pierced, she stayed true and her commitment to God. Amen? You may not always be able to maintain relationships with, with the person or thing that you're attached to, but remember this, it's not about you. It's for the glory of God. Some of you, your children may not be living in the home right now. You may be going through the pain of separation. Your husband, your spouse might have left and walked out on you. A young lady was talking to me earlier and I don't know where she went, but it was awesome. She told me I prayed for her when she was here before. She's lost 110 pounds since the time I prayed for her. I'm gonna have her lay hands on me and pray for me, honey. Impart it back into me, you know, that anointing, I can lose it. But she was sharing with me how that she'd gone through such a difficult, difficult time because her mother was, was, was upset because she got saved. Are you in here? Stand up. We want to cheer you on. We are so proud of you. She's known the pain of separation. Her mother kicked her out because she was serving God. But she's still serving God. And even though she went through that hard time, she said, I tried diet after diet, and I made up my mind I'm going to let the Lord help me with this. And she's lost, no, it's 115 pounds. 115 pounds she's lost. And she's still working on it. And I said, you go, girl. But you know, we have those times that we do have to go through the pain of separation. I'm going to move along here. But do you love God enough that even through the separation from your dream, from your promise that you'll remain faithful. Can he trust you? Can he trust you? Number four is timing. Can God trust you to wait for the right timing? We remember that when Christ was launching his ministry and beginning to work miracles that he was at a wedding, a wedding and in Cana and you know, they'd run out of wine, how tragic. But anyway, to his mother, he, she was all worked up about it, you know. So she comes and tells him, you know, that, 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 that there's not enough wine. And you know how he responded to her? He said, woman, mine hour has not yet come. And you know what? Sometimes we get so upset, our emotions get so involved when things don't happen in the timing when we think they're supposed to happen. If we get mad at God, and everybody else because we fix it in our mind how we think the timing is supposed to go but God wants to be able to trust you to wait for his timing on everything that comes timing is very important I want you to listen to this to be a successful dancer you must be able to respond to the timing of rhythm how many of you are dancers well you have to be able to respond to the timing of rhythm right and it's the same in the spirit there's a timing you have to be able to respond to the timing in the spirit when I was growing up it was a sin to to dance and I always have loved black music I mean I can feel it. And I wanted to dance so bad. I wanted to get my body into the whole thing of what I was feeling on the inside. 
and I couldn't do it. And when we were little, we didn't have a TV because my mom didn't want a TV in the house. She felt that it was just too much distraction and evil and everything else. And so we only rented a TV when the World Series came on because God was in the World Series baseball, okay? So that was the only time we had a TV till I don't know how old I was, maybe about 10 or so, and then we got a TV. We decided it was okay. We could, you know, screen the programming. But you know what I did? That TV was on this little cart that had wheels on it. And so on Saturdays, if my mom wasn't home, I'd pull that TV into my bedroom and I would watch Soul Train. And then start that line where everybody's coming through. And boy, I was just, you know, I was trying to get into the timing and the rhythm because there was something inside of me. I needed to release it, and I couldn't seem to do that. And I would repent as soon as Soul Train was over because I knew I wasn't supposed to watch that, and it was evil and all. I'm so glad that we've learned that dancing's not a sin. I'm so glad. And I still move as white as white can be. Now, I don't sing that way, but I still move that way. But I am so glad my kids, you know, when I was pregnant with Bethany, Brandon would come to me about every few days, always with several people around. Mama, what color is our baby going to be? Is it going to be black or white? <sighs> of course, this implied I had not been faithful to my husband, so I would just die. And we've always had a large black following in our, our ministry. My dad had a large uh, black following in his ministry, and they're, they're with us, and we love them. And we, I mean, they're like our kids. I, I, they call us mom and dad. I mean, we love it. But when Bethany was about three, she went up to one of the black girls in the church. She went up to Sicily, and she said, how old am I going to be before my hand turns black? When am I going to turn black? So I brought... The members of my praise team over to Verl's church about two weeks ago. We were in Maryland. And, and so the young people, because I told you I'm training them to preach, so two of them had preached on the platform in between the songs. And so my son, first guy preached was T.D. Jakes Jr. His mother's sitting right over here, and you could get her autograph after church. But he's awesome. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then my son started preaching, and Verl's son walked over to me, and he wiped my arm. He said, there's no black under there? I don't get it. You know why? Because we don't need to teach our kids all this racial stuff. We're one. So my kids can dance as good, if not better, than all the black kids in the church. And so I might not can do it, but God's letting it happen through them. But to be a dancer, we have to understand that you have to be able to respond to the timing of rhythm. And please understand it's the same in the spirit. There's a rhythm to everything in God's spirit. There is a rhythm. There is a timing to everything in God's spirit. And if we get so anxious that we get it out of kilter and we get the timing in the wrong direction and we do it the wrong way, then we might end up being mad at God, but it's actually our mistake because we weren't women who could be trusted to wait for his timing. Oh, and that is so hard. I was playing a song in the car for my mom on the way over here that uh, Clint Brown has written called Waiting Patiently on You. And I said, who waits patiently? I said, I, I really will have to work on it before I can even sing this song. I said, it just makes me cry every time I hear it. But waiting patiently, waiting patiently, it's hard. But I know that if you'll yield yourself to God and you'll let him work in your life, you also will be a woman he can trust to wait. Hallelujah. See, if we don't get God's rhythm, everyone can tell that we're out of step. Now, when I dance it's not, and I'm out of step, it's not because I don't have God's rhythm. It's because I'm white, okay? <laughs> but we're talking spiritually. If they don't get God's rhythm and everyone can tell then that they are out of step because they birth things prematurely and they threaten the very lives of their God-given dreams. That's so good. There's a time for everything. Can God trust you to resist pressure that would rush you into his plan for your life? You don't want to get into it too quick. You might not be ready. Number five is rejection. We really are going to finish. I know it's really hot in here, and I'm trying to hurry. But, huh? You're not hot?
Let's see. What do I blame it off on? Being 40, being overweight, or the anointing? Anointing sounds good. So I'll take, okay. <laughs> All right, rejection. Number five is rejection. One time while Jesus was teaching, Mary came to him. She actually had like traveled to where he was to go see him, okay? And when his disciples told him that his mother was waiting outside, he responded, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Now he was making a really important point here, okay, about, about the body of Christ. But don't you imagine that hurt her feelings? If I go somewhere to see my kids or to hear them or to watch them when they were playing sports and everything and all, I don't want them to stand there and act like, well, who is my mother? I'm busy. I don't have time for you right now. But that's where he was. Oh, that was like, you know, he had already told her when he was earlier, when he was 12 years old. He said that he was about his father's business. He let her know he had his own agenda. And those things pierce our soul sometimes. We feel a little rejected. Get our feelings a little hurt about that, don't we? God wants us to rise above that. Jesus' own mother, who went through pain, endured scandal. She had nurtured and yet protected him all of his life, but she had to face rejection, and news alert, you're going to be rejected too. So just bow up and handle it. Don't cry about it all the time. We've all been rejected. Christ was rejected his whole life. Mary was rejected, but we can make it anyway. Because we ought to please God rather than men. They're not going to accept us. They're not going to like what we do. Do it anyway. You're doing it as unto the Lord. Amen? People will not always respond to you or to your ministry the way you like. But can you be trusted to remain faithful? That's a hard one. People may get up and leave your church. They may leave your ministry. But can you be trusted to remain faithful? What do you do when you have danced all over the church, yet you still hadn't been healed? Do you still trust him? What do you do when you get slain in the spirit, but yet when you get up off the floor, all of your debt is still there staring in your face? Can you still trust him? Because we're talking about trust. Can God trust you, but now can you trust him? What do you do when you pray a seven-step prayer, and yet your crisis still doesn't go away? Can God say no to you and trust you that you will still dance, pray, and praise him. Number six, her soul was pierced through death. Here's a woman who didn't ask for this child in the first place, but it was a promise that was birthed inside of her. She's cared for him all of his life, always had to worry about, was he going to be protected? Was he going to be safe? Was Herod going to catch up with him? What's going to happen? And, and ultimately, the death came. He tried to tell her, but, but none of them could really understand what he was saying. And... At Golgotha, Mary watched her son hang from a wretched, rugged cross, and she watched everything that she had labored for, her promise, everything she had fought for, and built her life around, and yet she never turned her head. She stayed there and watched that. Now, I don't know if you really have ever thought about that, but I'm going to tell you about a personal experience real quick. Uh, about 10 years ago, we took a missions trip to the Bahamas, and it was a missions trip, let me tell you. We were there for seven days and had 14 services. We had one time that we had an opportunity uh, in one afternoon for a little bit to run to the market and to ride a glass bottom boat, but we were exhausted. But we took like 25 people with us down there and it was an awesome time God used us and it was an incredible time of ministry. But while we were there, because the food and everything was so expensive and we mostly had teenagers with us because I have a tremendous heart for young people and I work uh, with a youth at our church and will, till I die, I will be working for youth. I'll be 90, even 105 holding youth conferences because I believe in youth. And so I, uh, I was uh, at this, at this um, we were eating at McDonald's so that it would be affordable for kids. How many of you have ever worked with youth and you know that by the time you come back from the youth conferences, you're sick of McDonald's and Burger King? Okay, <laughs> so we were in McDonald's and uh, someone had picked up my daughter Bethany, who was about three at the time, and put her on their shoulders not realizing that right there, there was a metal ceiling fan. And those metal, you know how a ceiling fan even in your house can collect so much dust. It's amazing how quickly that they're all dusty again. Well, those metal ones just seem to have grease and ugh, yeah, everything on them. And we had been told before we went on this trip that, you know, 
the doctor's situation is not real, real great. You know, it's not, everything's not real sanitary and all that kind of stuff. And if you have a problem, you know, we always uh, endeavor to bring a nurse with us anytime we go anywhere just in case there's a problem that we've got everything handled. And the nurse was not with us at that moment, okay? And so they picked Bethany up, put her on their shoulders, and all of a sudden I heard the scream. And I, I, my children had never had a head wound. I'd never been around that. I did not know that head wounds bleed, you know, a whole lot, even if the wound itself is not so, so bad, but that there's a lot of bleeding. But I didn't know that. And I remember then that, that fan just whacked her, and, and she screamed, and uh, I froze. I glanced at her once and then I couldn't look again. And, and, and I don't know how long it elapsed. It seemed like a long time, but I'm sure it wasn't very long at all. But I just, I just stood there and uh, there was a, a, one of our black brothers that was with us and I, I just kind of leaned over on him. I said, help my baby, help my baby. But I could not move. I just, I, would, I didn't know if it had cut into her eye. I didn't, I didn't know what, I didn't know what had happened. And I couldn't even look. And my husband was running back behind the counter because everybody at McDonald's was standing and watching. They were doing nothing to help, and he's screaming, somebody help me. And he went in, back into the kitchen and got ice himself and brought and got it on her head. And we were three miles from the hotel, and Garland ran with her three miles with ice on her to the hotel till he could get her to, to the nurse to care for her. That's the most tragic thing, thank God, that I've ever had to deal with. She's got a little scar there to this day, but her hair covers it, and you'll never know the difference. And that's a miracle. It could have been horrible, infection and everything else. But I cannot imagine a mother sitting at the foot of a cross and watching her son die, staying right by his side. And there's some of you, you haven't had to watch something like that happen. But you had a promise that has died. And you've watched that thing die. And some of you have become bitter over it. I'm speaking prophetically right now. Some of you have become bitter over it. And you're going to need to let go of that. You need to repent of the bitterness. You need to repent of the unforgiveness for people who seemingly got in the way and hindered that dream from coming through. Because if God gave the dream, he can still bring it about. He might have to redirect some paths, and it might go a different way. He might involve some different players that are easier people to work with. But we've had dreams, all of us. But some of us have seen them die. Don't give up. Remember this, death is an opportunity for a resurrection. He's a resurrector, and he wants to resurrect those dreams, those broken dreams in your life. My, what a woman that could be trusted. She still remained faithful to God, though she did not yet understand the process that her son was dying for our salvation. She didn't understand that. We were talking just in the room last night. My daughter was talking about how much she was ministered to by Fuchsia Pickett's message. And we were talking about her life and, you know, how anybody could complain, you know, to, uh, for the little inconveniences we might face in the ministry and to watch this woman of God up here in, in pain delivering the word. It's phenomenal. And it puts us all to shame. We have no room to complain about anything. And we were talking about that when Fuchsia was at our church a while back and she was preaching and she shared that when she first was, you know, it was first, you know, discovered that she had this osteoporosis, that she was at a, a conference somewhere and, and someone came up to her and said, can I hug you? And when they hugged her, it actually broke her ribs. And that's when the decline in her body began. And as we were talking about it, Bethany said, you know, I think that would be hard for me to forgive someone I would have to really work at forgiving someone when, when, when it was their action that caused me to have to suffer all these many years. 
And my mother said, well, honey, you would. She said, you know, all of us, we, there are things that we go through and we have to learn to forgive people because people do things that inflict pain upon us, you know? And my mom talked about, for instance, she said, sometimes you'll see people that maybe, maybe they were, they lost a family member in a car accident and they have to learn how to, how to forgive the, the person who was driving that other car, you know, because they caused that death. And what I'm telling you is this is a mother right here who could not understand why her son was going through all of this. It was such a struggle for her all those 33 years, always worrying about him. She had other children too, but there was something about him that the enemy wanted to destroy him before he was ever born and so she's got this constant weight and pressure and now she's watching it all die but she didn't get mad at God she didn't blame God you know how I know because she was part of the 120 in the upper room it says that after Christ was raised from the dead and he was with them for 40 days, opening book, uh, chapters of Acts talks about that, that he was with them uh, and he was explaining to them and teaching them things about the kingdom of God is what the word says. And then he went on to tell them to tarry for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And after he's told them about that, then he was ascended on high as they watched. And the people stood there and the angels said, why stand you here gazing? This man of Galilee, which you have seen taken up from you, is so coming back again in like manner. And then it says that they went to the upper room to pray and to wait for this promise of the Holy Spirit they didn't even know what that meant but they were being obedient to what he told them and said that Mary the mother of Jesus was with them and I have to ask you what are you angry at God for some of you are angry and you're blaming God for things you gotta let it go how can we read about an example like this and see that she had the ability to forgive and still remain true to God? There's nothing, ladies, worth your relationship with God. And then I just wanted to say that Mary stood at the base of the cross and she said, like Job, though, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. She trusted God. She couldn't even have understood what was happening. She didn't know that through her son's death that God was reconciling the world to himself. She had no idea that in three days, you know, when he was dying, that he would be resurrected to new life. She just stood there watching him, but she trusted a God she didn't understand. Can you trust a God even when you don't understand? When God's purpose brings pain in your life, can you be trusted to stand and say, God, you can still count on me? How often we hinder God's processes because we don't understand. And the last one was disappointment. I already kind of touched on it, but if you're keeping taking notes, it was disappointment. And it was like after Christ's death, Mary walked away from Golgotha, not understanding that he was going to be raised, but yet she did not walk away from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says that everyone who was in the upper room was filled with the Holy Spirit. But Mary had a little unique distinction there. For her, this was not a new experience because the Holy Spirit had filled her once before. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've experienced the, the testings and the piercings that Mary did, but I do know, ladies, that we cannot be controlled by our emotions. We've got a great work to do. We've got a great work to accomplish for the kingdom of God. We don't want to be guilty of committing Adam's sin, of not accomplishing that that the Creator had intended us for. You know, God wants to work powerfully through your lives. I shared this message at our church on Christmas Sunday, and one of the things that the Lord had just made so clear to me was, that I shared with the people was that Mary was the carrier of Christ, but you are too. And with it comes a great honor, a great privilege, but a great responsibility. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for men and women of God who we can read about and study their lives and we can learn so much and we can be challenged by those things that we learn and we can take them and apply them to our own life. And I, I just ask you today, oh God, that you would cause us to be women, oh God, that, that you can trust. You, you've been looking 
since the very beginning of time that people you could use for people you could use many are called but few few choose to pay the price but god there's women in this room today that are willing to pay the price there's women in here who've been angry they've been angry even at you but today lord i sense that they're going to repent and they're going to put that behind them oh god and father they're going to press on so that you can use them mightily hallelujah we just honor you for what you are doing not only in this room but across this entire premises across this property in every class that's being taught and father what you're doing in our lives deposits that are being made so that we can take them back home to our own churches and cause change to happen. And Father, I just bless you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was told that I could give an altar call. I know that was session supposed to end at 4.30, and I'm going to move along as quickly as I can. But, but what I am going to do is just call you up here. I may not lay, uh, lay hands on everyone. We do not have... Uh, catchers they said so I'm gonna ask the women in here from my mentoring group if you would come and you would assist me with that in the event that I'm needing it and um, but if there are women in here that as I've been speaking you have felt that there are areas in your life where God has not been able to trust you that you have let him down and you need to repent I feel like I would fail God if I didn't give you the opportunity to come and repent right now I believe once the word has come forth it's the time to go ahead and let's seal the process at that moment and if there are women in here and you feel that there's something in your life that you may need to repent about because you haven't been faithful. Maybe you've had unforgiveness. Maybe you've allowed your emotions to control you. I don't know what the situation is. But if you feel the need for prayer, if you just uh, come and uh, line up across the front or if you want to kneel and pray, whatever, uh, and, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a, a corporate prayer. And if the rest of you have to go, if you could just go quietly in, re in respect and reverence for what's happening down here. And uh, and, and the rest of it, you know, you, I, will, I will lead you in a prayer and I'll try to come and pray for some of you. Um, myself um, but we will we will try to leave at 430 in compliance with what we've been asked to do um, so I just want I'm gonna wait just a few minutes for you to come down here hallelujah 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 would you just repeat this prayer after me even as you're coming